This is episode 17 of Soundproofist, and my name is Carrie. And I'm Phil. And today we're talking with an interesting team of researchers and acoustics experts about their ongoing project called London Street Noises. They're documenting the street sounds of very specific locations in London, like Leicester Square. These sites were chosen based on some recordings that were actually captured in 1928 at the same locations. We'll learn about those recordings, past and present, and what they tell us about daily life in London. I didn't know about London street noises until Carrie introduced me to it. They have some fascinating recordings from London in 1928, and they have a wonderful project that explains the history of acoustics and soundscape in London from then, and very interesting stuff. But first, let's meet the team. John Drever is a professor of acoustic ecology and sound art at Goldsmiths, University of London. My name is John Drever, so I'm a professor of acoustic ecology and sound art at Goldsmiths. My background is in music and, and sonic art, but I'm also qualified in acoustics as well. Ashigal Yildirim is a researcher at Goldsmiths. Actually, I don't have a background in acoustics. My background is in sociology and criminology, and I'm currently doing a PhD in sociology at Goldsmiths. Uh, university and John is one of my supervisors. My relation with sound and noise comes from my PhD project which is on the effects of aircraft noise on individuals and communities. And Mattia Kobianki is an acoustic engineer. Well I initially studied uh, electronic engineering back in uh, Italy in Rome with intention to work in the audio sector and I managed indeed to work uh, for many professional audio companies after finishing my master in 2005. But soon after that, I started also to become interested in environmental acoustics. And I did a diploma in acoustics uh, at uh, the Ferrara University in Italy. And as soon after that, I started also to work with a company, Architettura Sonora, uh, which is manufacturing acoustic system for indoor and outdoor applications which was doing very interesting stuff in terms of a soundscape approach to manage noise issues in urban areas and especially parks and gardens. And that's also when and where I started to become also very interested in soundscape after uh, environmental and technical acoustics. And finally, in 2013, I moved from Italy to the UK to join Bowers & Wilkins, a hi-fi company, but where we owned for speakers and headphones, and I bumped into a very interesting ad for a collaborative doctoral award at Goldsmiths. I got the award, and I started this PhD part-time with John uh, as my supervisor in adaptive soundscape composition, and basically picking up the research that I in 2009, 2010. Can you describe the London Street Noises project? So it's, I mean, the starting point is an amazing record by Columbia, Columbia Records from 1928, which is called London Street Noises. And on one side, there's a recording from Leicester Square. The other side is a recording from Beach and Place. And what's extraordinary is that we have this voice of, which we understand is someone called Commander Daniel, who introduces the recordings. And he tells us exactly the time and the date, and uh, also we know the location, whilst he's making the recording. So he talks through the recordings. This record is being taken in Leicester Square at quarter to three in the afternoon of Tuesday, the 11th of September, 1928. And this is 1928, so it's really pioneering field recording. So this is the starting point. And back in 2008, I was aware that it was the 80th anniversary of all the recordings. So I was able to go back to one of the locations on Beach and Place and some PhD students went to Leicester Square at exactly the same date and time to record the 80th anniversary. And then uh, 10 years later, we had the 90th anniversary last year. And I did a bit more research and I suddenly became aware that there's a whole set of recordings made at this time, uh, which were in a box in the Archive Museum of London. and and then did more research because this project was supported by the Daily Mail. And I looked into the Daily Mail archive and suddenly become aware of many, many articles around 1928 about the effects of noise on health and well-being. So that's really the, you know, the, this kind of exciting point. 
a really interesting kind of gap in history. It seems to be uh, an important moment, actually, in acoustics and kind of soundscapes and field recording. But hasn't really, it's not in history books, so it's really exciting. Yeah, I've listened to some of them, and it's really quite a cacophony in 1928. You know, and, and part of it is there's sort of a... The narrator's voice is a little bit like similar to what you hear sometimes in the old newsreels, a kind of kind of a high pitched sound. So I'm not sure if that was really, you know, some of the timber of everything was exactly as it sounded on this street, uh, because his voice sounds a little like this, you know, but the amount of actual just din on the streets, there's a noise, but it's a different sound. And I think part of it might be the cobblestone streets and the types of motors that were prevalent back then. I was very surprised. We have a nostalgia for a kind of quieter time, and we imagine 1928 being a wonderful time, but actually it wasn't. It was, as we can hear from recordings, it was noisy. Apparently, yeah, apparently it was very noisy. I was really quite surprised. Well, can I ask a question about that time period as well? Because it seems like there's a lot of articles written about how the noise was a growing concern um, from businesses and people in the city. And as we hear, it's quite cacophonous in the recording. It seems on your website, they said that they did eventually do some mandate for restricting horns on automobiles. What other kind of, uh, you know, is there other legislation or remedies that people would do to try to deal with this noise that you've discovered? Yeah. So they take the recordings in throughout September 1928. And first of all, the Home Secretary and other officials uh, listens to those recordings. And these, all these things happen very quickly, I mean, within, within September. So they took the recordings of five locations and the ministers listened to it. And the Home Secretary was pretty much impressed by it, who himself was actually to, used to live in one of those areas in which the recordings were taken, Cromwell Road. So he was actually quite a keen supporter of the project. And they did organize a conference to discuss a draft regulation on noise, on traffic noise. However, I don't think we have evidence on how the legislation negotiations went. So we have legislation in 1931, which is called Road Traffic uh, road Traffic Act, wasn't it, John? Uh, yeah. So it's it's not until uh, 1931 that this motor horn and use of motor vehicles are regulated. So about a three years from the time that the recordings were made, which in the legislation world, that might actually not be unrealistic. You know, that's actually probably good. We learned that they were trying out quiet zones as well in parts of London to restrict the honking of horns as well. And I find that the horns from that year are quite cute. They're that kind of, uh, you know, that, like, you know, that air blowing one. They're lovely compared to the modern electric horn. The deeper horns that we have now, yeah, and the backup beeps that we have now. I've seen uh, an old video, for example, of San Francisco in uh, 1906, just before the earthquake, and they had a camera mounted on the streetcar going all the way down Market Street, and it was just kamikaze the way that people drove, at least in this video. So possibly these horns were just used with no traffic lights and other forms of traffic management. It was just a way of saying, hey, I'm over here, get out of the way. A quite unnecessary motor horn. So I just wanted to add that it is clearly stated that in the 1931 regulation not to use motor horns in order to annoy people just to use it when it's absolutely necessary. For safety or something. Yeah, for safety. Yeah, and that's in the Highway Code. That's where the Highway Code appears around this time. And so one of the Highway Code regulations is to, you know, is when you can use your horn. Do you all have any uh, concept of uh, the architecture there? I mean, I assume buildings then were much different than now, so the, the amount of noise that would be blocked from the walls would be much different. Do you have any sense of the differences in architecture then and now and how that would impact the traffic noise on residents? Probably, probably not. I think a lot of the locations, Cromwell Road is beside the Natural History Museum, and so these buildings were already there. And so a lot of the areas are actually haven't changed. They're quite kind of classic London locations, Leicester Square. Well, Leicester Square, interestingly now, is now pedestrianised. 
in modern London, but it wasn't then. I guess that's one change. And I guess there are, but it's quite an open space. So these specific locations are quite similar. I mean, one, one of the locations was where St. George's Hospital was. In fact, the hospital's moved now, but we did record in the same location, which is kind of Hyde, what you call Hyde Park Corner. So that hospital is gone, but it was very interesting they actually chose that location because they were concerned about the effects of traffic noise on the people in the hospital. Uh, another thing is, so there are two residential areas, well, then residential. They are uh, Cromwell Road and Beecham Place. So Beecham Place is a very small street, and back then it suddenly becomes an alternative route to the main road it's linked to. So there's a sudden, there's suddenly this uh, big lorries and motor cars driving through the the tiny streets and making considerable disturbance to the residents. But today it's again uh, it's changed. It's mostly shops and restaurants in there. One thing that I noticed in the newer recordings was the traffic seems to be moving faster and more smoothly. So it's still a lot of noise, but it was a combination also of horses back then as well as motor vehicles. But also it's more of a kind of a, a swooshing sound as the traffic light changes and, uh, and, you know, you hear a lot of cars, almost like water, almost like an ocean noise at times. And then you get to uh, the pandemic and there, one of the locations was just the sound of pigeons. <laughs> you know, there was like no, almost silence except for the pigeons. In one location, the, the one thing that remains is the extractor fan at the side of a, of a hotel. <laughs> Um, which is very loud, actually, and it becomes more prominent. Matthias has been studying these. Oh, which one was that? Yeah, uh, Cromwell Road. In Cromwell Road, from, you, can, you can hear over the, you know, from the recording just made shortly before, uh, the fan's kind of in the background, but then the fan, I made the recording in pretty much the same location, so the traffic's gone down, but the fan is still, it's, it's quite loud, there's a lot of high frequency as well as low frequency, and it's quite, it's quite dominant. Matthias has been analysing the different recordings, actually, from those eras. Yeah, it's, it really shows you, like, how different types of frequencies and different types of noise can disturb people, but also sometimes a quiet location with one really disturbing sound is actually worse than multiple sounds that are continuous. It was actually featured in the relevant newspaper article exactly as you described. So it's intermittent noise. It's more disruptive of sleep, of rest than a continuous drone of a, of a traffic. Going back to 1928, do you feel like you've gotten some insights into like the culture of London at that time from these recordings? Absolutely. I mean, for me, the most notable example may be, might be the St. George's Hospital. So St. George's Hospital is one of the key locations that did the recording, uh, did the sound recording. And each patient there giving headphones and they're listening to prompt concerts in their headphones. So that's interesting. I mean, I'm just thinking aloud, so it might say something about their taste in music. So why not Duke Ellington? Why not Louis Armstrong? But BBC prompt. So, so St. George's Hospital is a very, you know, one of the oldest hospitals in London. So it must be a very, proud and uh, important in uh, London's history. There's wonderful whistling in one of the recordings. It reminds us of this a tradition of whistling. We don't really whistle much anymore, you know, whistling a tune. And it's quite, it's a really powerful tune that cuts right through the recording. Well, I was just wanting to clarify, if I understood this correctly, they gave the patients in the hospital uh, headphones to listen to in order to mask the noise of the street. Yes. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, wow. the patients... I didn't even know there were headphones in 1928. That just shows how naive yeah, I am. Yeah, I was actually like, so surprised as well. <laughs> yeah, I thought they were a much more modern invention, and I wonder what were they connected to? Did they all have to sit around some sort of giant console with a, a cable? I think they were doing live broadcast. They were doing live broadcast from the Albert Hall, which is not that far down the road. Uh, listening to the proms concerts uh, of the day. Really interesting, and they were ahead of their time. And we've had other conversations through this podcast with people who specialize in hospital noise and also in dementia ward soundscapes. 
So we think we're having these conversations as new. And here, you know, almost 100 years ago, they were using headphones for people in hospitals as a calming effect. It's really interesting. This was after the First World War and an awareness of shell shock, uh, which is a kind of a recognized phenomenon then, and particularly in hospitals. And actually one of the languages used about the effects of the traffic noise is a bit like shell shock on the ears. So that was a you know, so that was a kind of very, there's a large cultural awareness of noise impacting on people's well-being and their, their kind of mental health. Now, you know, a big issue with the recordings is that uh, decibels hadn't really, I mean, decibels was a thing that hadn't been really recognised as a way of measuring loudness at this stage. Very shortly it would be. So the sound recordings were used as a way of demonstrating loudness which is really interesting. And then, of course, then decibels kind of takes over and that kind of shifts the agenda. And then maybe when acoustics are more focused on and kind of the effects of noise on hearing loss. But in this era, we learned from the articles that the concern was about the effect of noise on people's nerves, on their, their impact on sleep, on their being, becoming less efficient in the workplace. So it's quite a different way of thinking about the effects of noise. In some ways, more contemporary because it's a more about the, a more holistic effect rather than just hearing damage. Yeah, interesting. I mean, both are relevant, but yeah, if you just focus on hearing damage, the problem with that at times is, for example, in the United States, the common goal is to not expose someone to 85 decibels or more for more than eight hours. But what about those first eight hours? You know, that's a lot of time to be exposed to 85 decibel noise, and that has more than just hearing loss impact on your health. The stress level of seven hours of 85 decibel noise is not something that I think is acceptable either. And that number 85 doesn't tell you that much as well. Right, exactly. I actually just, for the past three weeks, have had a massive road construction project going on directly outside my apartment windows that far exceeded 85 decibels. But there were times when certain equipment that they were using was, I was measuring it, of course, but there were times when it was showing up as maybe 67 decibels inside my apartment with the windows shut, but that doesn't mean it was an okay amount of noise when I was trying to get my work done. It was quite loud and distressing because it was, you know, jackhammers. So it's 67 decibels, but so is my stereo if I'm playing a record. So it doesn't tell you really the impact of that noise on residents. So I know Mattia might have to jump up early, so I want to make sure I ask this question now. Um, John had mentioned that you're doing comparative analysis of these audio recordings. Can you tell us a little bit about that process and what kind of analysis you're doing? Well, we've just started. We've prepared some material that we have partially presented uh, during the online launch events and during the Beach and Place armchair sandwalk that we hosted on a Sunday. And we have basically put side by side the spectrograms of these recordings to help uh, visualize and not only hear the differences so that, uh, for example, we can see how the sounds of horns are, as John was uh, noting before, is quite different because of the technology used uh, in the horns. Sirens were completely absent because uh, they uh, were only stalled much later in the 50s on emergency vehicles. They didn't use sirens at the time, they used something like bells or other horns, but not uh, the siren that we are familiar with nowadays. And um, it's also interesting to hear, for example, the sound of uh, steam engines. At the time there were still steam engines and uh, combustion engines like the ones we use nowadays. So they were sort of uh, still living together. And uh, we found something similar in terms of comparison much later, although we have not uploaded uh, and made these recordings available yet. We also have that in 2008, we still had uh, diesel taxis in London with a very specific uh, sound uh, or noise, if you want. Uh, while in 2018, 10 years later, diesel engines have been banned and there is no trace of that type of noise of the diesel engine. And what is also interesting, especially for the lockdown recordings, is the absence of traffic as actually made visible and audible, visible in the spectrograms and audible in the recordings when you play back at them, birds that are actually always there. It's not that we have not seen for years and years and all of a sudden they are back to the cities. A lot of species are actually 
uh, living in London all the time, uh, feral parakeets, pigeons, magpies, uh, crows. So you have a lot of birds that you would normally completely miss because they're simply masked by the traffic noise. And in the sound, in, in the recordings during lockdown, these sounds of their calls are actually much more audible. And it's also very good to observe us in the spectrogram. You can see them also just uh, above some vehicles pass by. It sounds like they stop when there is a lot of noise. Sometimes they, it's like they know that they won't be able to get through to whoever it is that they are communicating with other members of the species, so of course, but they stop and then they pick up the conversation just after that uh, car has gone by. Some of the soundscape projects during the pandemic uh, that's been sort of a common theme is like the bird song that no one knew was there. But you're actually doing something where you will be able to compare this. You will have data to compare year by year now, which is really going to be super helpful. No, it's very interesting. It's important to stress that whenever we are listening to snapshots of what is a street on a specific day in a specific year, we are not claiming that that is representative of what that year sounded like, of course. We have not this sort of assumption of being able to do like an average when you quantitative analysis and you gather a lot of data and you extract something which is uh, representative of the mean or the average. In this case, we have like a picture. That picture could be a very a lucky day where the weather was nice and you have sunny day and uh, everything looks gorgeous and then you can be instead visiting the same place when you're later and it's very bleak uh, and cloudy and dark. This doesn't mean that you have captured the essence of the place. It's just a snapshot. It's still very interesting and some, of course, knowing more about the places helps in understanding how much those sounds are or not uh, very common in those places, like the diesel engines. So we know that they, they were quite common in London, so that is a good example of something that can be compared the presence or the absence of that type of engine noise. But in some other cases, we cannot really say this era is quieter or is louder or is better or is worse. It simply doesn't make sense to try and abstract this type of conclusions from just recordings uh, done in a few uh, locations in London. Yeah, well, this year, because we got interested in Beecham Place in particular, and this year the, the day is on a Sunday, but actually it was a Thursday, if I, I think if I remember correctly, the original recording. But what was great was on the 90th anniversary, it actually happened to be the same day of the week as well. So we were able to compare a Thursday from 1928 at the same, uh, on, I've got the exact date now, but in October at that date to, the, to, uh, to 90 years later on a Thursday at one o'clock at the same time of day. So that was nice. I just wanted to add a point that Mattia has made. I think, yeah, it's very important to to know that so to make a proper history on urban sound environments is tricky because sound recordings on their own, as Mattia said, don't say much thing. But in this project particularly, I think it's very interesting and we are very lucky that it's a newspaper initiative. So you have lots of written commentary and, and I think it's it's a treasure. And well it it also has to do with the journalism, uh, the style of journalism I think, uh, the investigative journalism which we don't see at all today. Because investigative journalism these days, you know, they only focus on the extraordinary events like wars, like terrors, but they don't focus on the everyday life pretty much. So what happened here, they, they captured a glimpse of everyday urban life and with sound recordings and with commentaries and with lots of stories. And it doesn't only include elites of the society as in the most cases of campaigns against, against noise, but it includes, it's, it's welcoming to, to the wider members of the public. So that's what makes this Daily Mail project very important, I think. Yes, uh, Daily Mail. I mean, 
in the 80th anniversary, I didn't know. I hadn't done my Daily Mail research then, but in the 90th anniversary, I had done the research. And this photograph in Daily Mail pointing to, here's the microphone, had to do a bit of homework then to, because the streets have slightly changed, the numbers changed, the shops have changed, but the beach in place was a closed shop and it's now turned into a fancy restaurant. But I could work out the shape of the arch and work out exactly where the microphone was, uh, which is really exciting. I was curious to know about some of the sound walks you've been organizing. You had one just last month, and I think you did one last year as well in September. And is this associated with capturing more recordings for this project or just in general trying to interest more people in in listening to the sounds of London? Shall I answer this? I mean, the sound sound walks have got lots of different functions. I think in this regard, it was, you know, us tuning into the place on the location, getting people to listen to the location together and share listening and then we could share the app we've been working on also share historical recordings and then have that discussion in situ in those locations and some exciting things happen people joined us and people saw us with microphones and they'd stop and they'd they'd say oh what, what are you doing and then we'd say well it's about traffic noise and i could show them the fo- actually a photograph look here's a photograph taken in 1928 and this was recording was made and then people would go oh we need to talk to you. We've got, you know, <laughs> people suddenly got very, you know, opinionated. And there's an interesting story that came up, which I wasn't aware of, but actually it's a really big story that in uh, that part of London, which is a very upmarket part of London, it's beside Harrods, basically, Beach and Place, Harrods and Sloan Square. In the evenings, a lot of people had very high level sports cars, Lamborghinis and Ferraris, which they race this, around the streets of London, making a lot of noise late at night. So that became a big issue. And it's and actually the government's been trying to control noise levels of all these high speed sports cars that somehow somehow escape noise legislation issues. So there's suddenly you tune into a kind of contemporary noise debate just by being in the streets and people talking to us. And then what happens? And of course, you get kind of serendipity. So there was another moment when we were recording where suddenly we heard police whistles being blown, you know, very old fashioned police whistles which have you know, been around since the late 1880s or so. And it, I think it was royalty. I mean, so in Britain, when the royalty comes past, they, you have motorbikes coming with police whistles and they stop the streets. And then this car zoomed past. But it was very nice to catch the sound of a police whistle, which is an, an, an ancient sound going back, you know, more than 100 years, but still being used, still penetrates the soundscape. Powerful, powerful device. And somewhat unique to London, possibly. I mean, I can't say that we hear them in other cities it's or funny, you know, it? Yeah, <laughs> it is <laughs> on the motorbike blowing a whistle it's like a funny kind of archaic but it works yeah as i've seen in hong kong but to do with a kind of british colonial thing that this spread of the whistle i don't i should do some more research but uh, it's it's sort of like you could have sort of a quiz of without showing any visuals capture the sounds of a number of cities and then ask people what city is this I guess you'd have to have been in some of those cities or watched a lot of films or something to know the answer in some cases, but that's really interesting about the police whistle. I did want to ask you about a little bit about your process of transferring the recordings. I know you covered this in a seminar I went to of how you actually transferred the recording, which was, I think, on a shellac disc, to a digital format that was not really an easy process, was it? Mattia, do you want to? I mean, there's a colleague called Ian Sonhaus who did that work, but maybe Mattia looked, looked a bit at that process. Yes, this was done in the electronic music studios uh, at Goldsmiths by Ian Sonhaus in uh, mid January 2019. And he used a Stanton turntable with a specific cartridge uh, for uh, shellac discs, which is different from the one used for vinyls. And the digitization was done on a Navid Pro Tools HD platform according to the audio preservation guidelines of the International Association of Sound and Audiovisual Archives, which means basically even though the recordings themselves on Shellac are not that uh, hi-fi in terms of a resolution and a frequency range, the digitization was done at the maximum possible bit depth and sampling rate of 24 bit and uh, 192 kilohertz. And once the recording was available as a digital file, ideally there should be an equalization curve, uh, also called the emphasis applied. The equalization curve was there uh, in all of the shellac and vinyl disc recording to sort of maximize the quality and especially compensates a little bit the fricative noise during the recording and also during the playback by uh, emphasizing the high frequency content during the recording. But until probably the 50s, there were a lot of different uh, equalization curves used uh, 
by different uh, companies and for different purposes. And uh, since we don't, uh, we don't have the information about uh, which equalization card was used back in 1928, all of those digital files have been left completely untouched and unequalized. This doesn't mean that in the future, maybe doing some more research, we won't be able to find uh, a reliable source for which is the exact equalization curve uh, to use, and then we can maybe make the recordings sound a little bit more natural, but I think that even as they are, they are still very intelligible and can tell us a lot. I think it's sort of, it's to be expected when you listen to a recording from such a long time ago. Let's not forget also that 1928 was just three years later than the first electric recording was really started. So before that, it was acoustic and mechanical recording. So big horns used to amplify uh, the sounds uh, that you wanted to record, and uh, this would then be transduced and uh, transmitted directly to a stylus, which would carve a wax cylinder or a wax disc. Uh, in 1925, they started to use microphones, vacuum tube amplifiers, and the electric recording era started. So it's still very early days, and I think it's still astonishing how we can sort of capture and listen almost 100 years later to those sounds of people, vehicles, horses, and Commander, Commander Daniel, voice and commentary. Yeah, I think... Your website noted that the recordings were done in, in some cases just hanging a microphone on the outside of a building, outside a window. That was the height of technology probably back then to just be able to do that. And they had to heat up the, the discs with ovens and get a specific temperature to then hand it over to immediately record and for only like about four minutes. So the, the complexity and the, the space and the kit was just enormous. I mean, it, it's, it was a huge effort. I'm not an expert in this field. This is Ian Stonehouse field of expertise, uh, audio preservation, and uh, I assume it's the preservation of most uh, manufacts and artifacts, whether they are uh, audio files, uh, images, or uh, other type of media, would normally be done always with a state-of-the-art technology, I would assume. And I also think there is a sort of uh, sense in uh, using the maximum possible resolution and sampling rates, uh, thinking at what may be possible to do at a later stage with different technologies to retrieve more information from these recordings. So there was some restoration attempted with some uh, plugins, but the result was still not good enough. Often when you try to remove noise, you also remove some of the information that uh, is there. And this is mainly related to the algorithms that you use. It's quite possible that in five years' time, the power available and the algorithms developed in the meanwhile will allow to do audio restoration at a much higher standard and uh, maybe we could uh, uh, remove a lot of the hissing noise without uh, losing the high frequency details, still a relative high frequency because the bandwidth of this recording stops at around 5 kilohertz, which would be almost top of the vocal range, but you, you still have a lot of intelligibility there for voice and the higher pitch sounds. And so hopefully in, in future we may be also be able to improve a little bit uh, uh, the quality of this recording when new techniques become available. Do you use the Hush City app at all? I think I had the idea that you have an Echo Interactive Sound Walks, and I believe you're also working with Antonella Radiki with the Hush City. Is that correct? Well, yes, that's a sort of, that is a very personal connection because Antonella is one of my best friends. And uh, we met when I was actually working in Florence with Architectura Sonora, and she was finishing her PhD in Florence and she was interested in what we were doing in Architectura Sonora and basically uh, we started to collaborate and then uh, we became very good friends and yes, we, we have used uh, in um, uh, the Echoes uh, app uh, 
hash CT as a link to uh, suggest uh, users of the um, Echoes app when they enter our own uh, geolocated soundwalk to also record and share their own uh, recordings of the places they are visiting uh, with the Echoes soundwalk. Of course, Hash City is meant to be uh, used as a tool to map quiet areas which cannot really be set for many of the locations uh, of the London Street Notice project but it's still a good chance to document uh, what those places also sound like uh, for all of the different users that have visited those places in different days uh, and different time of the day. Do you want to limit the locations in London to those same locations that you've been documenting so far, or do you want to expand to other areas? Mm, I would say we will probably improve and expand the amount of material and analysis that we have on those original recordings. We're not planning to cover more locations. There's already the excellent London Sound Survey sound map by Ian Rouse, which covers a lot of locations and many different types of sound in London. And I think for us it makes sense to use all of the original Daily Mail campaign locations as a case study because we have those original recordings and it makes sense to keep comparing and studying across uh, time and across what's happening in those locations. As I mentioned, we have uh, some additional recordings from 2008 that we are preparing to be then uploaded onto the sound map on the London Street Notice website. And we are working at some more analysis, both, uh, as I mentioned, with uh, spectrograms and also in terms of historical analysis of the sound, the story of those neighborhoods. So I think that is where we can really add our own uh, values as researchers and also this unique combination of different uh, skills in our team. Uh, There's one location that I'm interested in to add, which is uh, I stumbled over uh, Virginia Woolf talking about stepping out her street in October of 1928. I forget the date now. And she mentions this in a room of her own. And, you know, it's just about a month after the, the London Street Noise recordings. She talks about stepping out into the street where she lived. And she describes the, the traffic. And the, actually, it's very quiet. She talks about how it's surprisingly quiet. And she goes into lots of detail. And that's great because, she, again, she says exactly the date and time of all that. So I'm keen to maybe add that as an, an interesting location. So that's in Bloomsbury. That could be an interesting location to record to where we have a, a record of it through, through literature rather than a recording, but it still gives us an impression. It was really fascinating. What an interesting history. So glad to hear about the project and can't wait for the 100th anniversary. Let's hope we make it. I'd really like to thank John, Eshigal, and Mattia for talking with us today on Soundproof us about this exciting project. You can learn more about it at their website at londonstreetnoises.co.uk or listen to some of those recordings on SoundCloud. I'll put some links on the Soundproofist blog for you. Thanks for listening. <laughs>